Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes during the lockdown. Please forgive the audio quality on this episode, we're still working out how to do this remotely. This week, Rachel and I spoke with lyricist Tim Rice. We talked about his collaborations with Andrew Lloyd Webber, Elton John and Disney, his songwriting process and the business of musicals. It's a great episode and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, so Tim Rice to Always Take Notes. Could we start right at the beginning and could you explain how one begins a career as a lyricist? Well, there are no specific rules at all. Like most careers in entertainment or indeed in anywhere, any walk of life, um, there's a lot of luck and it happens to be where you are and when you are. And I was quite lucky in meeting Andrew Lloyd Webber when I was very young and he was even younger and we clicked. Um, and that came about through quite a string of strange coincidences, including um, a trip to a book publisher I made when I was about 19, trying to flog an idea for a book. And he mentioned he um, didn't like the book, but he'd heard of this great young composer that, that, that he was helping called Andrew Lloyd Webber. And one thing led to another and I went round to meet Andrew and he was desperately keen to write for the theatre. I was more interested in trying to do something in the pop world. And I was actually a, a law student at the time. I was um, training to be an articled clerk as a solicitor. And I wasn't doing very well at that. And I thought I'm going to have to change jobs at some point. And Andrew, meeting Andrew, got me into writing lyrics, which I had done. I'd, I'd done a few pop songs on my own. And uh, eventually I joined EMI Records and the rest is geography. And do you think that this was kind of born in the, the wider social milieu of the 1960s? Do you feel, did you feel that you were part of that or no. was it? No, I was just a bloke. I didn't. I mean, um, the swinging 60s, I suppose, were happening. I think we were very aware of the fact that for the first time, well, all kids were aware of the fact that the first time the British popular music acts were all doing very well in America, which had never really happened before. I mean, the biggest act before the Beatles by miles was Cliff Richard and the Shadows. And they'd had virtually no success in America, even though they were really good. And um, we didn't think it was strange as kids. When the, when, when, when the Beatles had their first big year in 1963, when they were huge, by the end of the year, they were the biggest thing British pop music had seen, but they still hadn't made it in America. And we didn't think that was strange. I thought, well, of course they won't make it in America because they're British. But uh, by 65, when I met Andrew, the Beatles and the Stones and all the other acts were conquering the world. But we didn't really feel, I mean, I felt very proud in a way, I suppose, that British pop music was leading the world. But um, Andrew was much more into musical theatre and that was, a, that was a different ball game. And in fact, in theatre, looking back on it, we had done quite well in America with Lana Bart, um, Anthony Newley, people like that. Um, so that was a kind of different area of work. But certainly, I didn't think of us as being influenced or part of any great reaction. This is, this is something that you can look back on later. Historians and this, that and the other can look back on it and say, well, of course, they were all part of the same thing. And maybe we were. But at the time, I didn't think, well, because Hard Day's Night is number one, therefore, we'll be all right. You described in one interview writing songs with Andrew Lloyd Webber while being a glorified office boy at EMI. What did yeah. that collaboration look like? Was it kind of going home after work and writing, writing songs together or something? Yeah, absolutely that. Um, I actually moved into Andrew's family's flat, which was, um, they had two adjoining flats in South Kensington. So there was a fair amount of space. There was room and, and, and there was a spare room for a lodger. And that was me. Um, in, in one of the flats and um, I would work at EMI. It was nine to five-ish, strange these days. You wouldn't get that happening in record companies now, but you wouldn't get record companies now, but um, nine to five, you had to clock in literally and clock out, even if you were going to a club or something in the evening to look at a potential act. Um, but if I wasn't doing anything for EMI in the evenings, which I guess was most nights, I would come back and Andrew and I would go out to supper or try and write something or whatever. But that was all we did, really. Andrew um, was a student, and he was just about to go up to university. So um, we worked in the evenings and weekends together. And but I, you... I, could, I, I couldn't really work on writing 
stuff with Andrew while I was at EMI because I had a pretty full-time job even though I was lowest of the low. And were you conscious, again, this may be a, a case of looking too retrospectively, yeah. but that you were writing uh, show music as opposed to pop music? Because I was just reading an interview with you that was saying that in the 50s, a lot of like Broadway show songs were in the charts and everything like that. And then with the Beatles, there was a kind of bifurcation and the, the genre split up. And then that your work brings it back together again. Were you conscious of those genre divides at the time? Well, I think not really. Well, actually, oh, I don't know. It's an interesting question. <laughs> Again, at the time, one didn't think about that particularly. One didn't analyse what you were doing. You were, you know, teenagers who just did what you wanted to do. Um, but I think when I first met up with Andrew, I was very impressed by him. He was clearly very talented, but his work was very in the traditional Broadway um, tradition. It's not, not a very good sentence, but never mind. Um, in in that the... the Shows he'd already written by the time he was 17 were very influenced by Richard Rogers in particular and also Lionel Bart. And he was halfway through a show which needed some lyrics based on the life of Dr. Thomas Bernardo. And it was a very Oliver type show. It was good. I thought his tunes were good, but the concept and the idea were a bit old fashioned looking back on it. And when I was working with Andrew, the first time I'd had a go at writing show music or show lyrics rather, I Yes, I was probably more influenced by people like Lionel Bart um, and Oscar Hammerstein than I was by um, Mick Jagger or, or John Lennon or Paul McCartney. Um, because the first show we wrote together was very traditional. And that's partly why it didn't work. I mean, it wasn't good enough anyway, but it wasn't original. That was the problem. And then when we did Joseph for kids, and we never thought that would get anywhere, but that was very original. It was, wasn't quite like anything else. And we played around with a lot of popular music styles. We, we put an Elvis Presley type song into what became a big musical. And um, that, that was a bit of originality, which I think was why we actually got going in, in, in you know, quite a big way. But we weren't consciously trying to get into the charts. I mean, we were, except, except we were, because we were also trying to write pop songs. And because of my connections with EMI, we, we got one or two songs recorded, but we didn't get a hit. Um, but I think... I think certainly in the first two or three years of, of working together, when we were mainly working on our Dr. Bernardo musical, we must have subconsciously seen what we were doing as definitely apart from what the Beatles and co were doing. But of course, when we did Joseph, which kind of almost by mistake got us into the more well original and pop and nearly rock, Joseph's not really rock, but it's, it was contemporary at the time. Um, we, and, and then, of course, Superstar, we suddenly found that we were actually aiming for the same market that the Beatles and Stones had conquered. And that's why we, it worked, really. We, we, we didn't do, even do that consciously. We just wrote what we wanted to write. And I think Andrew, who was very traditional, and me, who was much more of a rocker, um, I think the combination of the two of us was probably why we did quite well. Where would the ideas usually come from? And who, out of the two of you, would normally take the lead in kind of shaping that? I liked um, the fact that Jesus Christ Superstar is inspired by a Bob Dylan lyric, but Evita was, grew out of a BBC radio documentary yeah. that you'd heard. Well, uh, I, supp I mean, I'm not trying to claim credit, or I am, I suppose, but um, the ideas for the, for the three shows we did together were basically mine, but that was, it had to be that because I had to tell the story. And um, the, the music Andrew wrote, um, which um, was... Brilliant in all three shows, I thought, Joseph, Superstar and Evita. That, that's something that you, you could transfer. Um, I mean, the, the, the great melodies, some of them might have worked in other shows. Um, but I think with words, it's almost impossible. You, you, you've, you've got to be inspired by a storyline, as, as, as a composer has as well, of course. But, but I had to be very happy with, with telling a story. I was brought into The Likes of Us, which was our Bernardo musical, and... Um, I, I wouldn't have chosen that, I don't think. But at the time, I was happy to do it. And it was a, quite a good story. Um, but Joseph was my favorite Bible story. And we did that because we were asked to do something for kids. And there'd been a thing out called Daniel Jazz, which um, had done quite well in schools, which was the story of Daniel. But it was very conventional and rather classically minded. And it wasn't funny. Um, and I wanted to do something that was funny because I, I was much better at funny words than, you know, romantic love stuff, or at least I was then. Um, and 
Joseph was written for children. Um, and I chose that story because it was my favorite story when I was a child from the Bible. Superstar was something, even though the Bob Dylan line um, from God on Our Side was definitely a major factor in making me continue to think about Judas Iscariot. I'd certainly thought about him and Pontius Pilate years ago when I was at school, um, years before, because I went to two or three schools in my time that were fairly religious schools. I mean, the, you know, they weren't church schools, but they were schools that were based around chapel and things like that. And I, I, I was always intrigued by the fact that Judas Iscariot was a key figure. Without him, you wouldn't have Christianity, you could argue that. Um, and he doesn't really get any lines in the Bible. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't have any motives that you can, you can really read about. He's a, he's a bit of a cardboard cutout figure of evil. And that, that thought, every time I went to chapel, you know, and it, it, Judas got mentioned, or Pontius Pilate, who was mentioned every day in the creed, suffered under Pontius Pilate. And I thought, well, Pilate was probably not a very nice guy, but at the same time, he just happened to be the bloke who was there at the time. And it was perhaps bad luck on Pilate that he, you know, was, was the bloke who had to condemn Jesus, who he thought at the time was just another rabble rouser. Um, although he was definitely affected and realized that he was something more than that. But um, so the, 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 st the stories of Judas and also Pontius Pilate always intrigued me. And I, I used to think, at least I think I thought, if ever I'm in a position to write something one day or paint something or, you know, whatever, not that I'm a painter, it would be, that would be a great topic, the idea of, of the story of Jesus told from the other angle. And I kind of forgot about it, I suppose, but the Bob Dylan song, which has that wonderful line, I can't think for you, you'll have to decide whether Judas Iscariot had God on his side. Brilliant. And that kind of was the whole of Superstar in two lines. And when we did Joseph, which was nothing to do with these thoughts, it was, although it was Bible, um, and it went really well with the school and with other schools. And, we, and, and when it was done at St. Paul's Cathedral, um, just an amateur production, um, but in a festival at St. Paul's Cathedral, the dean was very intrigued by the fact that we'd, we'd written modern music about the Bible. And he said, well, there are other stories you can tackle, Jesus. And I thought, yeah, he's right. And, um, but then again, Judas is the character. I would rather write a story from the point of view of Judas because um, I can identify with Judas. Um, I certainly can't identify with Jesus. If you do, you'll be arrested, I think. Um, we, can we but, talk a bit, you, you alluded to sorry, that. Sorry, am I about, waffling on? No, no, um, not, not at all. But you, you alluded there about how um, Joseph began as a, a prep school production, right? And then kind of yeah. beyond that. Could you, could you talk about, you know, the, the kind of mechanics of how it went from, you know, you producing this for one set of children at Collet Court to it being an, an international phenomenon. How, well, what, what were the key factors in that? Well, it took a long time to become an international phenomenon, as you so kindly put it, but it, um, we, we, we had a, um, Andrew's brother um, was uh, uh, Julian, a very distinguished composer and, and, and a classical mus musician, um, not composer, cellist, but I'm talking about Andrew's a composer, isn't he? <laughs> um, uh, Julian was being taught by um, a chap called Alan Doggett, who um, was a sort of friend of the Lloyd Webber family, really. And Alan had heard our demonstration records for The Likes of Us, which was our Bernardo musical. And um, we'd made this demo disc, an LP, um, of um, the songs from Dr. Bernardo. And this was going to be our great big musical hit, which, of course, didn't happen. But we played the, the um, demo, demo tapes or LP to friends and things. And Alan Doggett said, look, this is great. And obviously you're very talented, blah, blah, blah. But why don't you, while you're waiting for your inevitable success in the West End with this show, have you got time to knock off something for the kids? And this is a bit of a come down really, but we thought, why not? At least it'll get performed. And we'd been waiting for two years and nothing had happened with the likes of us. So we wrote this. And, and that was when, as I was saying before, the what can what what would kids like? And Alan had said Daniel Jazz was 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 quite a good idea, but it didn't really the kids weren't really grabbed by it. And that's when I thought, well, let's have a go at Joseph and let's make it funny. Both the music has to be instant and funny, and catchy, and the words have to be entertaining. And I think we pulled that off, and we did a twenty-minute show with Colic Court School. Went down really well, so we did it again 
so all the all the mums and dads could come along. Um, we did it again um, on a Friday night. Um, previously, it had been on a Monday afternoon or Tuesday afternoon, and hardly anybody came because a nobody ever wants to go to a school concert, and b the dads were working in those days. Um, so when we did it again, we, we we put it on the Westminster Central Hall, and we we, we got a reasonable crowd in because we got the whole school involved and all the mums and dads came. And it, Alan Doggett had said, the reason why this is a good idea, it, there's a good chance that an educational publisher will like the piece and then publish it and it can be sent to other schools. And you, and you might make a few bob out of it, which we hadn't made anything out of it up to that point. And um, uh, we said, fine. And, but the educational publishers never turned up. Um, although the thing with Joseph went down really well yet again. And so we were a bit disappointed. But the next Sunday, we got a rave review for Joseph in the Sunday Times, the Sunday Times. And it was by their distinguished music, popular music correspondent, Derek Jewell. And we hadn't expected, we hadn't asked any press because what if we had, we certainly didn't get any press that we'd invited. And um, uh, Derek wrote a rave review and said, this is brilliant. And then of course, suddenly we had a, we discovered that his kid was at the school, which we didn't know. That's why he was there. And B, um, we suddenly had publishers and even record companies saying, well, you know, can we record this? And that's what got going, Derek Jewell's review. And nobody really knows anything. I mean, people only, record companies in particular, theatrical producers, they only go with something if somebody else tells them that it's fantastic. Um, I mean, we had that with Superstar later on. Nobody wanted to do it on, on stage, so we did it as a record in the end. And then, of course, the record was hitting. Everybody wanted to do it on stage. Um, but we did Joseph um, on record, and we, and we signed a publishing deal, and, and a little booklet came out with the music, and we wrote some more songs, and that's when we did it at St Paul's Cathedral with, with a couple of extra songs put in, like Potiphar. And, um, and then we got a manager called David Land, who... Um, really liked um, Joseph, thought it was wonderful. Andrew had sent the album to his business partner, Sefton Myers. And Sefton, who was more into property, he was a businessman, nice guy who died very young, sad to say. And Sefton said to David, what do you think of this? And David said, I think these two guys are good. I think you should, you know, back them. So we were, we were backed and I was able to leave my job um, in the record business and we were being paid I think we got £2,500 a year each, which is great money in those days, more than I was getting at EMI. Could we talk a little bit about once you've had the idea, what the process is then together, how much research would you do, you know, the approach to character, whether you write the lyrics and then revise them endlessly. Can you kind of just well, walk us through how you, I, how you start? <laughs> gosh, well, with Joseph, um, didn't do much research. There's a wonder book of Bible stories. Genesis, that was it really. Um, and a lot of it, um, I mean, we just wrote it. We were young. It, it, it was very quick, what the, the, the first 20, 30 minutes we wrote. Um, and I found it quite easy to write allegedly funny words because you can rhyme, you can, A, you can use almost any word. If you, if you write a romantic love song, you can't, you know, use words like, um, you know, got my goat or, or um, you know, half these strange expressions, you know, that you're beyond the pale, all these sort of things. Um, or talk about coconuts and things. Whereas if you're writing a story, and the story itself can be serious, which Joseph's story really is a serious story in the end, um, you can be funny about it. And um, because you've got the entire vocabulary of the English language at your disposal, no word is really taboo. Um, or at least no tasteful word is, 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 is taboo. Um, I mean, pajamas and farmers, you could never put that into a love song. Um, so we just, I, I don't remember doing much research, just writing and telling, it's a great story, let's tell it. And, hey, Andrew, we need a, you know, bouncy tune here, we need a ballad. I mean, it's a couple of, a couple of serious songs in it. Um, and they, they, they probably took longer to write. And was that true of, of subsequent musicals as well? Were they as easy to, as easy to write? No, I think it got harder. Um, I think one of the things about Josie was we didn't think, in, in a strange way, I, I don't mean to sound flippant, but it, we, it didn't really matter. I mean, we thought, well, this is a school. 
Um, and while we're trying to do what Alan Doggett wants, and we hope the kids like it, it's not the end of the world if they don't like it. So there was no major pressure. Um, and I think that helps. Um, and to a certain extent, that was true with Superstar, or, although we, we were working then with professionals on the record, um, and we had a budget, and um, we were being watched carefully by the record company. Um, but I found in, in this business, the longer you go on in it, the more other people try and tell you what to do. It's really annoying. I mean, um, it's, and everybody thinks, certainly in the lyric, everybody thinks they can write words. So I get a lot of people, you know, coming up with suggestions, um, usually composers. <laughs> Elton is the one great exception. Elton has never queried any word ever. He might have said, I'd like another verse or, um, but it's, it's, I have found that the, the, so many people, especially if they think that there's a, there's a, there's a hit involved. I mean, um, if they think something's going to be successful, then everybody merges in on it and you get too many chiefs and not enough Indians. I was going to ask on, on that point that with the collaboration between the, the lyricist and the musician, you know, I was reading another interview that said that when you and Elton were working, um, that you were in different countries, it was all being conducted via fax. Yeah. But, but, but usually, all, yeah. like how... Are you, is it helpful to be in the same room in the same city? How, how, well, do, how, do you, how does that relationship work? Well, I think it helps to have a discussion in the same room. Um, I suppose you could use Zoom these days. Um, but uh, writing the actual words, I've got to be on my own in a room somewhere with no distractions. I don't even want the music really playing that, that, that I'm writing the words to because you've usually learnt the tune by then and it's in your head. And at the end of, well, I would find that if I'd written a lyric I quite like, I would then maybe play back the demo I've got of Andrew thumping out the tune and um, I'd sing along and see if it fits properly and it sounds okay. But um, with Elton, uh, there were one or two um, of the songs we wrote together. I was present when he, when he wrote the tune, um, but he likes the lyrics first, which is unusual. And so I would have to write a lyric, which, and all, and all I would say to him, I would say, well, this is, and obviously he can tell from, the, I hope from the words, what sort of song is required. But I would say, well, this is a kind of, I feel this is a bit like Daniel, or this is a bit like um, I'm Still Standing or whatever. Get just, you know, choosing from his huge repertoire, um, something that, that, that would, would give him a bit of a clue. But um, he didn't need me a beat to hang around when, I, when he's writing the tune and I didn't need him to hang around when I was writing the words. Um, but you do obviously come together and then you hear the final demo. And um, in the case of The Lion King, because it was so much, every song had to be part of the story. One or two songs we wrote got elbowed out um, or dropped or drastically changed because the plot changed. Um, and we weren't really 100% in charge of the plot. I was very much involved in the, in the story in the first instance with the writers and the director. But um, they, in a way, had the final say. It wasn't like an opera like Joseph and Superstar and Evita, when it was all music. All Is that typical for a lyricist to be involved in the, in the book or the libretto? Yeah, I think so. Quite a few musicals, it's book and lyrics by. I mean, with Evita, which doesn't actually have any spoken dialogue, I, I actually was credited with writing the book, whatever that was. I even won a Tony for writing the book of Evita. But I think um, the book can mean the story, which in the case of Evita, I did do the story. Um, nobody knew much about Eva Peron when, when we decided to go for that one. And I had to draft out a, a storyline which worked, which, which did work. I was quite surprised. <laughs> did you feel that there's a difference writing songs depending where they're going to be performed. So is it, was it different writing for an animated movie like The Lion King versus a stage musical? And then I, I was fascinated to see you wrote a Bond theme that you wrote All Time High as well. Yes. Uh, you know, is, are you conscious of where the song is going to be presented? Well, I think to a certain extent you are. I mean, I've always said that whether you're writing for an Argentine dictator's wife or a warthog with wind problems, um, you still have to put yourself in the position of that character and say what would he or she or it um, think. So in a way, there's no difference at all. On the other hand, with certainly working in animation, um, what was quite amusing was the fact that 
sometimes one would turn up and it, it was mainly what well, it was all done in LA actually. I mean, I, I, I spent a lot of the mid nineties in LA, which I enjoyed. Um, and you'd come to a Monday morning meeting, usually at some ungodly hour, like 7 a.m. And they'd say, well, we've decided that we're going to ax this character completely. And so some giraffe, which might've had five lines or a half a song was out. But because it's animation, the giraffe didn't have an agent and wouldn't complain. <laughs> so the alterations in animation can be quite drastic. Whereas if you're writing, um, certainly if you've got to the stage of, of, of writing something and you've cast it, then you, 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 you've got to consider characters and actors and everything. But um, I don't think there's a lot of difference in, in, in the actual medium you're using. You've just got to in my view, entertain and make every character in its own way believable. This episode of Always Take Notes is supported by Clean Prose, London's first co-working space designed specifically for writers. Based over three storeys in Shoreditch in the east of the city, Clean Prose's mission is to provide writers of all stripes, from novelists to playwrights, with a space and a community designed especially for them. To foster strong connections, Clean Prose offers a professional network that many writers miss when they work alone at home, at a library, or in a noisy cafe. The ground floor is an event space, offering workshops, talks from experts, and book launches. The first floor is an open plan common room. It is a space for writers to connect, collaborate, drink coffee, and develop their professional networks within the publishing, TV, film, and other creative industries. The second floor is a totally quiet space in which to concentrate and write, with private desks, lockers, and an extensive book collection. To find out more, go to cleanprose.co.uk. Always take notes, listeners, are eligible for a five-day pass to Clean Prose. To redeem this offer, please email write at cleanprose.co.uk with the subject line ATN-Welcome5. Likewise, I was interested to see these songs for um, Freddie Mercury's solo album. Um, how did how did that work? Were they commissioned, and did you kind of study his style before writing? The well, song? I knew Freddie. Um, I suggested to Elaine um, Page some time ago, what well, was some time before the Barcelona album, maybe only a year or so before actually, but that Elaine had had a, had a whole lot of hit albums done very well, and um, gets to the point, well, what do we do next? And I suggested that the songs the Queen wrote was so good, you could do an album of Queen songs done in your style. And she did that. And it was a jolly good album. It didn't do quite as well as some of her, you know, more traditional albums, but it was a, it was a, it was a good album. And I think she was the first artist to really, first major artist to recognise that the songs that Freddie and Brian and Roger and, and John wrote were actually standards they weren't just rockers they were a cut above an awful lot of other people and her her interpretation of of some of the songs was was really great and and freddie loved it and you know I, i'd met him once or twice i didn't really know him but um and then out of the blue i got a call from freddie saying look i'm doing this album with montserrat kabai and uh we we need one or two new lyrics would you would you like to do any i said you know silly question really yes and um uh I got to know Freddie moderately well by then and um, went round to his house um, and he gave me some backtracks and everything. And it was very exciting because it was him and Montserrat singing um, and, and they were very operatic songs. They weren't going to be ever commercial singles, I don't think, unlike the wonderful Barcelona song, which is just brilliant. Um, I mean, they were very good um, musically and I enjoyed doing them. And the tragedy, I, I mean, obviously tragedy in many ways, but when, when Freddie got ill and died, I just thought, oh, that's five great operas or musicals that we'll never hear. I mean, he was definitely, A, I think he would have continued with Queen because he was still brilliant. But B, I think he would have done one or two really great works, theatrical works on the side, as it were, or whatever you like to call it, at the same time. And I rule. think I would have been in, in with a shout of working with him on them. And I would have loved that. A rule that we have on the podcast is we ask every guest about money and how it's interfaced with their writing lives. Um, we've had people who you know, have made a lot of money from their work and people who've had quite the opposite. But with you, when, when was it clear that you could make a substantial earning from this? And how did it change the work? 
Well, um, we, we didn't make anything really until, well, the first money we made, we met in 65 and in 69. Um, so we had four years of not making any money at all, even though Joseph came out in the school in 68. Um, and we didn't really make any money whatsoever. I was still working at EMI, so that kept me going. Um, and then when we signed up with David Land and Septon Myers, we were getting what seemed a pretty good wage at the time, as I said, two five a year. But it was when Superstar, the record took off, that we actually got a really good deal. I think we got £10,000 each advance from Robert Stigwood when he bought David Land's company. And we said, well, David said, look, I can't handle this. The demands for the Superstar album are huge because the, the record had come out. It had been a number one in America and, and there were hundreds of people wanting to stage it and including what, Robert, what would right? what would ten th- what would ten thousand pounds be in today's money roughly well i i, I suppose it would be what, what year was that 1970 um or late very late 69 um because we signed with david in, in early 69 and by late 69 we'd, we'd 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 had a hit um no what am i talking about late 70 sorry getting confused we began recording in 69 this would have been late 1970 so I suppose that's 50 years ago, blimey. I would think it, it might be worth 10 times that today easily. So it could be 100, 250,000 and it's somewhere in that area. And I remember going on to the bank, we were given a check and I thought, oh, I'm going to walk down to the bank um, and pay this in and just see what the expression is on the bloke behind the counter's um, face. <laughs> I joined the queue and I think I joined the queue in the past. I've been mean, putting in checks of 23 quid and all that. And I handed in this check and the bloke just mm, <laughs> no interest <laughs> um but that ten thousand pounds seemed to be an absolute fortune and that was that was just robert stigwood um that was an advance on any earnings and of course the record in america was a massive hit so we made quite a bit of money off that and i and um but i i, I thought it would i thought well that's probably it i mean this is very lucky i've got two years of you know got to make the most of this and um i bought a house um, and a flat for my grandmother. And I thought, well, if I can't afford to buy anything else, it doesn't really matter. You know, I've, I've, I've got something solid. But of course, Superstar continued to be a success. And, and then Evita was, was just as big. And then Joseph took off. So we were very lucky. I, I don't know if it changed the work. Um, you'd have to ask other people about that. I mean, um, uh, it, it, it got one more into the business, um, obviously. And suddenly we were, we were, in demand we were the bright young things and all that now we're the clapped out old things <laughs> um and how does it work um with the royalties how is it split between the kind of composer the lyricist and everyone else involved well, in the, in aha, the, good of the song? um well we were always 50 50 and quite right too um i don't know i mean the producer of a show um, or indeed of a record, as opposed to the composer. There's usually a set um, split on copyrights for the actual song, but the producer of the record or the producer of the show can really say, I, I pay you this much, you this much. So um, I've always felt very strongly that the writers of the show should, it should be split, certainly of the music, should be split 50-50, whoever they are, even if one is very famous and one isn't. Um, I'm not sure that's always been adhered to in other circles. But um, when I wrote a show called Blondel, which didn't do incredibly well, it ran for a year with a guy called Stephen Oliver, who was very talented. But um, I, was, I was absolutely, I mean, I was, I was quite well known at that point, and he wasn't in, in the theatre circles, he was in the classical music circles. And I insisted that he got exactly the same royalties on the um, songs that I did. Um, unfortunately, it didn't make either of us very much money. Um, but uh, there are no hard and fast rules, really. Although the copyright of a song, and it might have well changed since my day, because it, we were all—it was just you had a record, you had a CD, you had an object which could be could be split up into. Um, nice slices of the pie now I, I don't know how they do it really to be honest i was reading um 
a review of, of Andrew's memoir, who was saying, it was a piece in the New Yorker, and it was saying that there's a kind of classic tale in music publishing of like, young artist comes up, signs a deal, gets screwed by the record company, all the money goes to them. And that with Andrew is the exception that he was, you know, he was sort of savvy from the beginning and working out how the contracts were set up so that you know, he retained ownership as much as he could. Was that similar for you? Yeah. Do you feel that you, you worked it out right at the beginning? And how, how were you able to do that? I think Andrew was much more savvy on that than I was. Um, he was really, I mean, he seemed to me wealthy when I met him, even though he probably wasn't that wealthy, but he had a bit of a private income, not much. I mean, I'm no idea. I think his grandmother had left him something, but he had a, he'd spent money on things age 17, like George the third wine glasses, which is <laughs> something that I would, I mean, I, I, if, if somebody gave me a tenor, I would, I would have gone out and bought five Elvis Presley albums um, or whatever. But it, it was strange that, that, that I mean, he, he had very sophisticated tastes, very young. Um, and uh, he had a huge record collection. He had a, he had a stereo radio. I'd, I'd never really seen that before, all, all these things. And, and I wasn't poor. I'm not trying to make out I was poor. Um, but he, he, he seemed to me to be um, pretty savvy about these things. And he certainly kicked up a fuss about the grand rights um, for shows. We, we, if we'd lost them, that would have been a, a major problem. Um, but, you know, the deals we got, we, 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 we didn't really own um, very much of the superstar publishing. But when we signed, we, was, we, we just, in order to get the record made, um, having not convinced any theatre people, we, you, you kind of had to sign. You, 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 we, we, I mean, we were going to earn from every stage, but um, we had to give away a lot of the rights to the MCA Universal Organisation. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had the record made. Um, and you usually tend to get paid for your previous record. If you have a hit, be it a pop hit or a theatre hit or whatever, once you've had the hit, you, in your next record or show, you can make a few demands. But the one that makes you the hit makes you popular. It's not always the one you make the money on. It's the next one. Um, and you're, 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 you're being paid for your name, for your fame, which is why I think it's ludicrous that people in you know, um, BBC, for example, they, they, they get themselves into so much trouble because someone's got paid more than another, but it's nearly always because the one who's got paid more is actually a name who's, who's, who people will tune in to see. And that's a very important factor. I mean, Elaine, when she got the part of Evita, um, I think she was paid something pretty ropey, like 400 quid a week for, and she was the star of the show. And that would have been, I suppose, today, that would be um, somewhere between four and 8,000. So it's not too bad. But she got 400 quid a week and she'd only been earning 30 quid a week up to that point. And David Essex, who was brilliant in the part, he was a star, a big star by then. And he was getting 5,000 a week. And that was in 1978. So he was getting roughly 50 grand a week. And Elaine was getting 4,000 a week. And that was, but that was fair in a way because even though Elaine had the title role, she was an unknown quantity. And it was a lot of pressure for her, of course, but she triumphed. Her next show, Cats or whatever, and Chess, she got fantastic deals. And of course, she got good record deals, but she'd earned it. And, um, uh, you know, she remains a big star to this day. And I would imagine she's paid extremely well for her radio shows and everything. And quite right too, because she's a name that people want to know about. How much does winning awards change your kind of bargaining capabilities I and mean, you've won Grammys, Oscars, well, I don't know. Ponies, I don't, all of that. I think awards are a bit of a joke really. Um, it's nice to win them. If, if, if you're nominated, it's, it's slightly nicer to win them than not. Um, but uh, it was very, it was quite exciting to, to win an Oscar. Um, that, that was just fascinating just because of the whole event and everything, which taken um, as an event is actually pretty awful, but it's still fascinating to be there. I mean, it's got worse and worse. It was, at least it was people had a laugh a bit back in, back in my day there, uh, much more so in the 50s and 60s. If you, if you look at some of the 50s and 60s Oscar award ceremonies, it, they're, they're wonderful. People don't take it too seriously. Now you get every boring actor and, you know, trying to make some speech about changing the world. You think, leave it out, mate. You know, we don't want to hear your... And that's what Ricky Gervais was so brilliant at, the Golden Globes. Thought he was absolutely superb. He nailed it completely. And still they don't get it. 
but uh, I'm slightly digressing. Um, awards are quite nice. Um, I've got them all in a cupboard here, um, and I don't take them out really. But it, it, it's 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 a good. I mean, people are impressed by it. There's no question of that. But it doesn't make you better or uh, more likely to have a hit next time. Had you ever written poetry? I was wondering. You know, there seems to be a there's there's a kind of perhaps as an outsider, an overlay between writing lyric poetry and writing lyrics. And I was wondering, was that, was that ever something that had attracted you either before or after? I, I wrote a couple of really bad adolescent poems at school, um, which the school magazine unfortunately published. Um, I've written the odd poem. The, I, I, I quite like the mathematics and the um, crossword puzzle aspect of it. I've written a few sonnets for friends occasionally as a sort of thank you um, letter if it's something you know that, that um, I want to thank them for and, and I, I like to put acrostics in you know spell words down with the first line of each song and um, but I hadn't really written I mean a book of T. Rice's poetry would be very slim and it unlike its writer and it it, it also wouldn't be very good <laughs> but I've got one or two um, things I've written um, I'm trying to sort out all my songs at the moment and and uh, get everything into some sort of archive but whether or not I'll include the poems, I do not know. There's probably not more than about 15 ever. You've also talked about wanting to write a play. Um, yeah. Well, what is it about drama that appeals to you? Or what would you write not about as well? Well, I think the main appeal is there wouldn't be a composer around. <laughs> but um, I, no, I, I, I'd like to write a play. I don't think I will now. I think I probably missed the boat. Um, but uh, I do like a, I like a good play. Um, there aren't very many around, but that's true of any art form, I think. You know, there aren't very many good musicals around, there aren't very many good pop records around, but the ones that are good are usually terrific. Um, so I've got one or two ideas, but I mean, Ava Perón would have been a good play, I think, but it's better as a musical. Um, if, you, if you have a larger than life character, um, I think Ava Perón is best treated with in a musical. I mean, there were lots of books that came out about her after, after the success of the show, none of which even mentioned the show, and all of which would have been unpublished if it hadn't been for the show. And, but I think if Ava Perron came back today, she, all the boring books have written about her and everything, um, I think she would have said, well, actually, the musical, that's what I'm about. It's about glamour and selling yourself, and that's why it worked. Um, what do you think of the resurgence of the Hollywood musical of Les Mis, like a genre that people thought was kind of gone and then came back in with great expense put behind it and things like that? Well, I'm not sure it has come back. You, you, you get, like, in all times, you get some shows, some films that work and some that don't. Um, uh, the Great Showman worked really well um, and Les Mis worked pretty well. I thought... Um, and, well, you've got things like Dear Old Cats, I'm afraid, didn't work. I haven't seen that. But um, a lot of musicals come out and, and, they, and, and they don't work. But I'm sure, I mean, we look back on the so-called Golden Age of musicals, you know, Saturday Night Fever, Grease and all that. Um, but there were plenty of shows that, and films that came out at that time which didn't work, but we just don't remember them. So I don't think, um, I mean, I don't know. But, but people will always... I mean, if if something goes big like Les Mis or or the Great Sherman, people say, "All right, let's 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 you know, let's let's do this." But you know, if something goes badly, people back away, and and, it, and it's got nothing to do with the trend. The public don't think, "I want to go and see a musical," or "I want to go and see a play." They think, "I want to go and see this particular thing because I've been told it's good by my mate." That's why people go. They don't really listen to critics, and they certainly don't think, "Oh, it's a trend. Musicals are back. I'll go." They don't think that at all. They think. My, my chum says that the Les Mis film is great, so I'm going to go. How do you but, think that the musical's business has changed, if it, if it has, since the kind of late 80s? How do I think it's changed? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's I, I, the, the basics of, of a good story and, and, you know, some thumping good tunes will always be there. Um, I suppose it's changed a bit in that you can do more, um, you know, spectacular sets and, and effects and all that. But I don't think that really makes a show at all. 
I think it's it's story that matters, and I and I I, I don't think that's changed. If you have a good story, um, there are one or two exceptions, of course, um, but a good story is more important than a good score. Um, if you have a good score and a terrible story, um, then it probably won't work. And if you have a great story and an average score, it could well work. If you've got both, like Hamilton, or dare I say it, Evita, you know, you're away to the races. You talked in interviews about your partnership with Lloyd Webber having this kind of 10-year span and that being typical for creative collaborations. Do you think, do you th- yeah. why do you think that is? Why do you think that's the period that it works? No, I think you kind of do, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are examples of people that kept going forever and ever, but not many. Um, I mean, Elton and Bernie Taupin, of course, have kept going brilliantly for a long, long time. But even Elton's gone off onto side projects, I'm glad to say. Um, but it's interesting. It, it only struck me when um, I did some interview um, some time ago, and I thought, well, yes, actually, I had, I had 10 years with Andrew that worked, went really well, and then a little bit of a quiet period. And then I had 10 years with Disney that went really well. And in both cases... After about ten years, without you, you didn't think, "Oh, that's it. I'll I'll go home now." You, it was just something that that seemed to have run its course. And um, I mean, I thought certainly after the huge success of Evita, I remember the opening night in London, thinking, "Well, this is great. We're you know we're going to do three or four more together." And but then Andrew wanted to do Cats, which didn't involve me. And I'm not saying he shouldn't have done it because it was a big hit. Um, but that kind of scuppered it, really, doing something. I thought, well, what do I do? And I, and, and I went off and did Blondel. And that that was good for me to do that. I, but I think I, I kind of assumed I would have another hit because I was always having hits. So I was a bit arrogant about it. But it had some good things in it. But it was good to have a failure because it taught you a lot more. And then I did chess um, with Bjorn and Benny, which was a great experience and in many ways did, did really well and is still going strong, although it was a disaster on Broadway, but that was, you know, one of those things. But it's, it, it's, it's a very popular show almost everywhere, actually. It's, it, it was about to, well, I hope it's still going to, but just before the lockdown, um, I went over to Moscow where there's great excitement about doing chess in Moscow in October. And I don't know whether that will happen now, but it really has been as a, a, a successful show and in a way I'm 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 glad that I've that I've been able to do some more interesting experimental stuff and different stuff with Elton and with Bjorn and Benny and with Alan Menken shows like Beauty and the Beast and all that um it's it's been good for me to write with other composers and I've been very lucky I, I mean you can't get much better than Bjorn and Benny or Alan Menken or um Elton these are A-listers A plus what made you, I mean, you worked on the original Lion King and Aladdin, and then you also worked on the recent remakes. What made you want to kind of revisit those particular projects? Well, I didn't really want to revisit the Lion King. I, 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 um, we were told they were going to do it, which is fine. I thought, well, you know, no problem. And um, uh, it was, it came out about this time last year. Um, and it was a big success, but I don't think the music was was actually um, part of that success this time around. The album didn't do very well and the music was slightly downplayed. It was all, it seemed to me, the film seemed to be all about the technology much more. It was beautifully done and, and amazing to watch. But I think they kind of lost a bit. I thought the original cartoon was just wonderful. It was a great, great film. And the remake was just a remake. That was all. And um, I, I, I wouldn't, rush to watch the remake remake again and we were asked to write a new song which we did but they shoved it into the credits um and which was a pity i thought um and elton wasn't too happy about that either but he but he, i was delighted with him because he was because he won um an oscar and had a big success the rocket man um so i mean it was fine i mean a, the Aladdin remake, I, I was, wasn't involved with that at all because I only got about four or five songs in that. But I thought that was, that was actually not bad. We're coming towards the end of our time, so maybe a, a couple more questions. But could you talk about your experience with controversy, particularly with Jesus Christ Superstar? What was it like being... How, how did that come to pass? And what was it like being in that spotlight? 
Well, I, I don't think we had incredible um, controversy. Um, there was a lot of protesting outside the theatres when we opened in the, in the beginning, but um, that, I'm afraid that just helped the show. Um, as Robert Stigwood said, well, we're on the front page, not, not just the theatre page, because when Superstar opened, there were punters wandering around with, you know, Jesus is the son of God. And, how, and sometimes I would go out in the early days and chat to them and say, look, we're not denying you that Jesus is the son of God. We're just, it's through the eyes of Judas Iscariot. Don't you get that? And most of them hadn't even seen the show. And I think what caused the controversy, in a way, ironically, was the fact that rock music, which at that time, you know, meant, you know, other than to its fans, but to the older generation meant drugs and sex and all that. And um, I think that's what they were, they were objecting to, that this disgusting art form rock music dared to deal with Jesus. Um, but the number of people who, vicars, priests, the Pope even, who've embraced Superstar, um, far outweighs the bonkers people who wander up and down the street with placards. So um, I guess, I mean, I suppose we, we, we harbour the thought, hope some nutter doesn't shoot us on the opening night. But I, I mean, that was a vague passing thought, but um, it, it obviously didn't happen. I mean, it still could, <laughs> but um, uh, it, it, it wasn't incredibly controversial. If, is there something that you're working on now? Is there something that fans should be looking forward to? Well, I did a show with a very talented young composer called Stuart Brayson called From Here to Eternity, which played in London for six months and, and weirdly got quite good reviews, but didn't, didn't latch on with the public. And um, I don't think it's, it's, it was a great show, but I think it, it could be. And we've been working on maybe setting up a UK tour of that because there were some nice songs. We had, you know, um, Michael Ball covered one of the songs, Claire Teal covered one of the songs. It's a good score. And um, I quite like, that would be quite a dream of mine to see from Edge Eternity work. Um, and it's, it's an interesting story. And um, I, that, that would be great for Stuart, who's a very, very talented composer. Um, I've got one or two ideas floating around. Maybe I should do my play, because the thing about a play is you can sit down at home and write it. You haven't got to send off words and wait for a tune to come back. Um, on that note, we should say thank you so much for being such a, a gracious guest and for persisting with the lockdown technological troubles. And, and, and no swear words. <laughs> no, no swear words. You can swear now if you like. Uh, <laughs> and, and wishing you all, all the best with your projects going forward. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to both of you. Thank you. Hello, it's us again uh, with an update from our lockdown lives. Rachel, how are you? I'm all right. How are you? Uh, <laughs> brief, brief summary there. Yeah, I'm getting used to it, just about. Um, I'm fine. I've been working from home like everyone else. We've been experimenting with the right kit to use for the podcast. Um, I'm trying to do lots of exercise and maintain a routine and all that. But yeah, not, not loving it, I have to say. Um, what about you? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say I was loving it, but uh, also trying to do some exercise, learning how to jog properly, which is proving difficult. Um, and yeah, trying to establish a good working routine, but can't complain too much. Excellent. Well, we hope um, everyone else is, is doing the same. Um, again, as in previous episodes, we'd like to flag our crowdfunding campaign, which is on Patreon. Uh, dot com slash always take notes this is a way for you to support the podcast and uh it really helps with us because it means we can pay our production team better and invest in better audio kit and rachel if you do support on patreon what are the uh, rewards that are available you will receive a bundle of successful pictures from uh friends and hosts of the podcast and uh yeah it's a way to see how you can craft a pitch um and how to hook editors interests uh, do have a look. Uh, that's patreon.com slash always take notes. What did you think of the Tim Rice uh, interview? I am actually a big musicals fan, so this is very exciting for me. Okay. Um, he was entertaining and good fun, and it was great to have something completely different. Um, we've not interviewed anyone who's done lyrics or songs before, so um, so yeah, it was it was a good insight into a different 
yeah, industry. Yeah. And we should say we'd had we'd had high hopes that we could use one uh, particular recording system to get crystal clear quality, but then it had all sorts of weird gremlins, so we had to go to humble Zoom, which accounts for why it probably sounds um, a little bit tinny. But yeah, I thought it was very interesting. Again, uh, not a world I know a great deal about, and fascinating to see how it all moved from being a kind of literally a school production to being a, a international juggernaut so yeah great great episode and hopefully the first of uh, of many songwriters that we'll have on always take notes anyway this has been always take notes hosted by me simon Acom. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer is Nicola Keane. Our social media is by Owen Redahan. Our graphic design is by James Edgar. And our score is by Jess Danheiser. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Always Take Notes, on Twitter at Take Notes Always, on Patreon at Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye. <laughs>